he should illumine us with the truth. He should also illumine this silent, dark immensity. That is the whole purpose. That is the entire raison d'etre of Savitri. He should live in his silent, dark immensity. That's silent, dark immensity. He is showing it to Savitri. It means that he is really exposing it to her. This is the home of everlasting night. When Savitri is there now, we shall be no more the home of everlasting night. It will be the home of everlasting light. This is the secrecy of my nothingness. What is the secrecy? In the presence of Savitri, the secrecy is that this silent, dark immensity, the home of everlasting night, shall be the secrecy of absolute everything. It, that is the secrecy. That is how it should be. That is how it will be. That is the secrecy. He is perhaps not yet aware of it, but that is what is already present in it. This is the secret, but in the context of Savitri, in the rhetoric of death, what he is trying to tell Savitri is, look, Savitri, you are trying something which is impossible. After all, this is dark immensity. After all, this is everlasting night. Your idea of bringing the values of truth here is absurd, is contradictory to the existence of this creation. It cannot be so. It is life's vain desire. It is life's vain. Give it up. Entomb it. Bury it. Forget about it. That is life's vain desire. As thou behave thy souls, O transient heart, and known from what the dream art was made, what dream thou art was made. After all, you are a dream made of transience, out of coming from life's desires, and it has no pertinence at all in the values that exist here. You give them up. You are a stupid girl, you are a foolish girl, you are something trying which is impossible to happen. It is vanity of yours. Has thou behaved thy soul so transient heart and known from what the dream thou art was made? You are made of this after all. In this dark sensitivity of nude emptiness, Hopest thou still always to last and love when nothing can last there, when nothing can exist there? What about love? How can love exist at all? It's impossible. Forget about your love. Everything become here. Nothingness. The secrecy of this nothingness is to reduce the desires of life to nothing. Give up your ideas. Forget about Satyavan. Go back home. If you want some boons, okay, I will grant you some boons. But you go away now. In this dark sincerity of nude emptiness, 
hope is thou still always to last and now the woman answered not now he is someone who is bigger than savitri the divine power herself who is standing behind the spirit of savitri there therefore the woman the divine power the divine presence answered not she did not answer after all what is he talking about why should i bother about what is what is saying is not true at all i did not get engaged into a kind of a dialogue with him her spirit refused the voice of the night that knew and death that thought her spirit refused the voice of the night that knew and death that thought now there is a bit of complication here in the sentence her spirit refused the voice of the night that is straight forward after all who is death death in the voice of the night she would not answer her at all she did not answer him at all a spirit refused the voice of the night but that knew who is that that knew is it the night that knew or is it savitri spirit who knew a spirit refused the voice of the night the spirit that knew and death that thought is it like that or is it the spirit of night knew the voice of the night knew a spirit refused the voice of the night that knew you read this in a single phrase then it becomes the spirit of the night the voice of the night knowing things yeah. which is not totally impossible but uh, uh, <laughs> but the implication is not that the implication is that it is understood that a spirit refused the voice of the night the spirit that knew and death that thought in other words you ignore this phrase a spirit that knew and that that thought sometimes in poetic construction it is assumed it is not deliberately repeated words like that it is assumed that they are understood in the next sentence in the poetic construction that is a style that it is a spirit that knew savitri spirit that knew after all the contrast between savitri spirit and death and not the at night you see a spirit refuse that well i don't know if a comma here after night uh, would i made it explicit a spirit refuse the voice of the night comma that knew and death that thought but then again the whole rhythm the whole meaning the whole content is lost and the charm of poetic art is lost shivendu is a supreme artistic poet he used every possibility every situation to bring out different nuances of expression this is one way of looking at it you see a spirit refused the voice of the night the spirit that knew and death that thought 
inert, beginningless infinity. Through her soul's reaches unconfined, she gazed. She saw the undying fountains of her life. She knew herself eternal without birth. All this is an aspect of her spirit knowing. Her spirit knowing the elaboration is here. In her beginningless infinity, through her soul's reaches and confined, she gazed. She saw the undying fountains of her life. She knew herself the eternal without birth. Now, this is one of the rarest descriptions in Savitri, which tells us the full divinity of Savitri. Like that, it has scattered here and there such descriptions speaking about Savitri's own divinity, her boundless self, her beginningless self. She saw the undying fountains of her life. Now, this is important. Undying fountains of life. She is facing death. What can death do with those fountains of life? She is helpless against those fountains of life. She knew herself eternal without birth. She is eternal without birth, yet she has taken the mortal birth. She has taken the mortal birth to meet this great man, to counter him. It is only that way he could meet him on the battlefield. The battlefield is on the earth. It is here things had to happen. Therefore, she has taken the mortal birth. Although she has taken the mortal birth, it is her eternal birth. But still, opposing her with endless night, death, a dire god, infiltrate on her eyes the immortal calm of his tremendous gaze. Although Thou hast survived the unborn void. Yes, this void is also unborn void. It has been there, Swayambhu. Always there, unborn. Which never shall forgive. It cannot accept intransigence. Transi intransigence. You cannot trespass into his region. If you trespass, you will not be forgiven. You will have to meet punishment. Although thou hast survived and born for it, which never shall forgive, while time endures, the primal violence that fashioned the thought, forcing the wild vast to suffer and live, this sorrowful victory only hast thou won to live for a little without one. After all, what is your gain with all that? Really nothing. What shall the ancient goddess give to thee who helps thy heartbeats? Only she prolonged the nothing, dream, existence, and delays with labor of living the eternal sleep. This is what the ancient goddess the Mother Earth, that is all she can offer you. She can't go beyond that. She, she can help your heart beats to some extent. You can live for a while. You can dream for a while. But ultimately, all has to enter into eternal sleep. Well, 
this also means that death does recognize something different in Savitri. That the ancient goddess is with her. That what she says here, he has some idea of it. In her beginningless infinity, through her soul's riches and confines, she gave. She saw the undying fountains of light. He is not totally unaware of it. He is not totally unaware of it. But that is because she who is without birth, eternal without birth, has taken the mortal birth. So he is aware of the other aspect of her mortal birth. A fragile miracle of thinking clay. Yes, after all it is mud which has produced man. And you are a fragile creature of that, you see. You are a fragile creature of that. Ah, what does man do? What does man thinking man do? He produces illusions. Walks child. Illusions walks the child of time. He is a child of time. He is a baby. He has not grown up at all. He has no power, neither awful power nor spiritual power. At the most he has got some mental capacity. But there is nothing. To fill the void around, he feels and dreads. The void he came from and to which he goes, he magnifies his self and names it God. Yes, this is my God, my thought. The agonies are built up. Religions are built up. You create deities out of deities. To fill the void around, he feels and dreads the void he came and to which he goes. He magnifies his self and names it God. He caused the heavens to help his suffering folk. So he is narrating what man is, basically. So after all, he is a small human creature. And who are you? You are also a human creature. Don't try to be smarter than that. We are just a human creature, you see. He sees above him with a longing heart, bare spaces more unconscious than himself, that have not even his privileged of mind, and empty of all for their unreal blue, and peoples them with bright and merciful power. So he creates imagination, he creates all these things for his own. For the sea rose around him, and earth quakes beneath his steps. The fire is at his doors, and death prowls being to the woes of life. Well, this is the plight of man, most horrible. And we are seeing disaster after disaster every day in his world. Not only now, they have been there since the beginning of this creation, in one form or the other. They have only changed their form and shape and their sophistication, but they have been there all along. Moved by the presences with which he yearns, he man. Well, actually, most grammatically, he is the child of time. Art, religion, child of time, he magnifies, he calls, he sees. But of course he has clarified, he has clarified the child of time by seeing that he is a thinking clay. That is man. And then he goes on describing the gods who wash the earth with sleepless eyes and guide his giant stumblings through the void has given to man, now he has made it clear, man, the burden of his mind. <laughs> so we are carrying that, that, that unhappy burden always on our shoulders, you see. 
<laughs> and we are proud of it. <laughs> we are mighty proud of it, you see. In his unwilling heart, they had lit that fire and sown in it the incurable unrest. So you are always searching this, searching this, searching this, doing this, doing that, doing that constantly, whether it is science, whether it is philosophy, whether it is uh, art, wherever it be, you are constantly, but you are really not discovering the real thing anywhere. Yeah. And that becomes his incurable unrest. His mind is a hunter upon tracks unknown. Amusing time with vain discovery, he deepens with thought the mystery of his fate and turns the song his laughter and his tears. His mortality vexing with the mortal's dreams. Well, he dreams of immortality, freedom, immortality. That is the formula of the life divine, the first sentence, first paragraph itself. He dreams of immortality. So he's denying life divine. His mortality vexing with the martyr's dream, troubling his transience with the infinite supreme. They gave him hungers which no food can fill. He the cattle for the shepherd gods. <laughs> So this is what man is, after all, and we are so proud of it. We have crossed into outer spaces, we have gone here, we have gone there, we have conquered the worlds, we have made huge, 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 big buildings, massive structures, what not, what not, and still we are doing. But all that thing is a cattle for the shepherd gods. <laughs> His body, the tither with which is tied, they cast for fodder, grief and hope and joy. <laughs> so that is our food, that is our fodder, you see. Dry grass fodder, you see. Grief, luckily grief, also accompanied with a bit of hope and joy. Otherwise, that fodder will not be tasty enough, you see, you see. <laughs> Into his fragile, undefended breast. They have breathed a courage that is met by death. They have given a wisdom that is mocked by night. They have traced a journey that forces no good. They, who are these they? These gods. In God's, yeah. Aimless man toys in an uncertain world, lulled by inconstant pauses of pain, scourged like a beast for the infinite desire, bound to the chariot of the dreadful gods, bound to the chariot of the dreadful gods, bound to the chariot. That is clearly reminiscent of Hector being dragged in the arena by, I am forgetting that name, famous name. <laughs> okay, well, see, uh, he was defeated. He was tied to the chariot. And then the chariot was driven in the arena seven times. The body dragged like that, like that. Okay, it will come sometime. But, that is clearly reminiscent of that scene. Priam's son, Hector, he was killed in the battle and he was tied to the chariot. And oh, the body, it was just the body. Huh? He was not alive anymore. No. He was tied. Yeah. Ah, it was just a triumph. Wow. Yeah. And the body was dragged around seven oh. times. It's, in the, it's such a cruel scene. It's, it's a cruel, cruel scene. And then next morning, his father goes you know, to that fellow and pays heavy ransom for recovering the body, for giving the funeral rites. 
So here, this is a very clear indication. Bound to the chariot. See, that is the reference. Or the dreadful gods. Yes, he was really kind of occupied by the dreadful gods. But if thou still canst hope and still lose love, return to the body shell, they tie to earth, and with thy heart's little remnant, try to live. See, this is the little hope I am giving you. See. Hope not to win back to thee, Satyavan. That is his ultimate thing. He is not going to bust upon that thing at all till the end. You are not going to win back the spirit of Satyavan. That is out of the question, totally out of the question. Yes, since thy strength deserves no trivial crown, yes, you have stepped into the darkness, you have done this, this thing, nobody, nobody, nobody in the entire occult history has stepped into the darkness. So you are not a small person at all. You have some greatness in you. And I must acknowledge that greatness of yours by rewarding you to go back. You are going back from my house. You cannot go back from my house empty handed. You have come here to my house. You are going back. You cannot go back empty handed. I am going to give you some boons, some gifts. Please take those gifts and return as a good guest. You have been honored duly as a guest. Go back now. Yes, saying the strength deserves no trivial crown. Gifts I can give to soothe thy wounded life. The pacts which transient beings make with fate and the wayside sweetness or bound hearts put pluck. Achilles, Achilles, that's the name of it. <laughs> what a fellow. <laughs> uh, he was a dreadful god at that moment. He had lost all his human qualities. The pacts which transient beings make with faith, and the ways of his sweetness, earthbound hearts would pluck these if thy will accepts. Take freely thine. Here you are. I am ready to offer you some gifts. Because you have come to my house, you are going back. So please take these gifts and go back. Choose a life source for thy deceiving pride. <laughs> See, he is very sarcastic, very, very clear about the human psychology yeah. and very fully aware of the human nature, how it plays and all that. So he is a very clever man also. See? <laughs> Choose, make freely thine. You see. Deceiving pride. See? There cannot be any bit of pride, a bit of praise than that. Deceiving pride. Yes, you want this thing, you want that. Take it away. No problem. No problem for me. Yes. You are deceiving yourself. We keep on asking, always, always, always deceiving prizes when we go to Samadhi. <laughs> we don't really ask the real thing because we are not really prepared ourselves inwardly to ask for the real thing. You had never asked what is really for our inner growth, for our inner progress, for our spiritual possibilities to open out, how they to open up. We never ask that kind of a thing. We keep on asking deceiving prizes. Give me this, I want that, I want this. Okay, no problem. <laughs> but the real thing starts when you realize what exactly to ask there. Your real worship, your bhakti, your real sadhana begins with that when you have prepared yourself intensely enough inwardly to ask what the real soul demands 
and you offer and ask, it is that which is immediately granted to you. The rest is all, it's okay, passing through. The receiving prayer is immediately granted to you. Nothing. You have to wait and patience and perseverance. Yeah, we, we keep on. See, we keep on. Uh, it seems that you are not ready. Yeah, we are. We are not. We are not really ready. We keep on ourselves pleasing with the deceiving prizes. <laughs> we keep on. We please ourselves all the while. Okay. 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 I see the ruthless and tremendous voice. Unendingly, there rose in Savitri the moonlit ridge on a shuddering flood, a stir of thoughts, but a some silence born across the sea of a dumb, fathomless heart. So he's giving now the simile of a sea rushing, how it is coming out of her. He says, Choose. A life's hopes. Now, again here, the responsibility lies on the one who chooses, not on the one who gives. Not on one who gives. Bhagwan Samne Aya Hai, Kya Chahiye? Aap Jo Dengi Wo Aisa Nahi Chilta. It doesn't work that way. The God is there in front of you. He is asking you what you want. And you say, what will you will give me? Whatever you will give me. It doesn't work that way. You had to ask what exactly you want. You had to ask exactly what you want. I want a fan. Okay, take the fan. You have to say, I want a fan. The responsibility lies on one who chooses, not on the giver. So these people are very clever. See, they are very clever. I see the ruthless and tremendous voice. See, it is a ruthless and tremendous voice. Because he was talking very clearly also, you see. Unendingly, the rose and savitri, like a moonlit tree, and a shuddering flood, a stir of thought or some silence born. Across the sea of a dumb, fathomless heart. At last she spoke. See, in the beginning she refused to speak. The woman answered not. She answered not because her spirit knew. So she did not answer. It was a general statement made by him. And therefore, she did not answer. Her spirit knew. But now, an offer is made. She is, in a way, forced to answer. She is compelled to answer. The offered logic says that she must answer. You are offered something, you have to say yes or no. You have to say yes or no. So with all the description of man, this is the plight of man and you are looking for that thing and what. Still, if you want some gifts, okay, have some gifts. And then, at last spoke, her voice heard by night. Her voice was heard by night. Although she is answering to death, it is in the entire panorama of night that the voice is ringing, 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 spreading, spreading, spreading everywhere. Everywhere. See, her voice was heard by night. So if it is night who knew, then this was not necessary actually. Night does not know, it is her spirit who knew. I bow not to thee, O huge mask of death. So she immediately recognizes, rather tells him, look here, mister, who are you? You are after all a mask, mask of the supreme, presenting himself as death. 
I know it. I have seen behind you the reality of you. What you are telling me is only the frontal part of it. I bow not, therefore I will not obey you. I will not obey the mask. I will obey the divine who is behind the mask, behind that black lie of night to the cowed soul of man. Man's soul is a feeble little bit cowed and is a black of night. Unreal, inescapable end of thing. Thou grim just played with the immortal spirit. Thou grim just played with the immortal spirit. You are playing a jest with the immortal spirit. Here, of course, it means both. It means here, immortal spirit stands directly for Savitri. In the cosmic working, he is a jest. He is playing a jest against the manifesting immortal spirit. So, in the immortal spirit actually covers both the aspects. Savitri, the immortal spirit. He is playing it just with Savitri, who is the immortal spirit. He is playing it just also with the cosmic spirit, which is there here in operation. Conscious of immortality, but now she makes it very clear. Conscious of immortality, I walk. You are alive, but I am conscious of my immortality. You cannot touch my immortality. You cannot slay my immortality. Although I have taken mortal birth, you cannot touch my immortality. A victor spirit conscious of my force, not as supplying to the gates I came. I did not come with supplication. Unslain as right, the clutch of night, by my own strength, I have been able to come here and enter into your domain. You are suffocating, you are smothering me. All kinds of things are there. I have withstood them. I am a vector spirit, conscious of my force. Now again, you see, we have already seen earlier what Savitri spoke about herself. Now here again, Savitri is revealing something of her own, that she is a victor spirit of conscious force. What is Savitri's divinity is once more revealed. So actually it will be good to collect all these quotations, Savitri telling herself who Savitri is. Savitri, this, is this is a good example of that, you see. My first strong grief moves not my seated mind. Look. My dear friend, it is not my mind that I have been grieving and all that. You forget about that. My unmaped tears have turned to pearls of strength. I have not wept. Satyaban had passed away on the ground. I walked all the distance with you. I have not kept even one tear coming out. I have not allowed even one drop of tear to come out at all from my eyes. My unwept tears have turned Pearls of strength. I don't know whether the pearls have strength or not, but certainly they have powerful strength here. They have powerful strength here. Actually, right in the beginning, we have got our unappeased tears. In the beginning, we have got that phrase afflicted by his harsh divinity. See, harsh divinity. Bound to his throne. He waited unappeased the daily oblation of her unwept tears. Now this was in, context, in the context of the <coughs> God of Pain. Here. The previous sentence says, Inheriting the long agony of the globe, a stone still figure of high and godlike pain, stared into space with fixed regardless eyes that saw grief's timeless depths but not life's goal. Timeless depths but not life's goal. Now in the wrestling of the splendid gods, 
my spirit shall be obstinate and strong again the vast refusal to the world well actually here it says see here thou grim displayed thou grim just played with the immortal spirit in one place mother speaks of death is a joker is a joker <laughs> very harsh word but this is he is a joker and she also says that as long as death is present things will always go wrong thing will always go wrong as long as death is present so that just is justified by the mothers is a joker he is playing a joke yes first i demand she says no i don't want gifts from you i demand gift from you you cannot but give me the gift so after getting a lesson from yama about what man is etc etc savitri still says all right all right that may be true but that you are offering me a gift that you are offering me gifts i demand but what is my demand now this is this is important i demand savitri is not going to be a supplicant i was born an equal spirit like so there is a question of you granting and i receiving that you are superior to me and i am inferior there is an occult necessity that savitri should accept what death is offering she must accept first i demand whatever satyavan my husband waking in the forest charm out of his long pure childhood's lonely dream desired and had not for his beautiful life he has grown up a boy in this forest he was a prince but he was driven out of the kingdom he is living in exile and naturally that royalty that form that majesty all those things which are there you would have definitely like to have them but more than that his father has lost his eyesight he must have his eyesight back so actually he says gifts so in a way these two are already implied in the gift one is the eyesight for satyavan's father and the other one is the kingdom back to him he says gifts is how the demand is for you now first i demand whatever satyavan my husband waking in the forest charm out of his long pure childhood's lonely dream desired and had not for his beautiful life well one can keep on arguing about this satyavan has grown up in the forest hermitage in the company of great sages he has himself great spiritual realizations already that is how he was making advances towards savitri he also told savitri look savitri i have found beauties of nature in this world around here i have also seen the grandeurs of the immortal plains and all that but between matter 
and spirit, there is no connecting link. Spirit remains spirit up there. Matter remains matter down below here. And they are not joined together. And it is a Savitri, you had come. And now the bridge will be, will be built between spirit and matter. You have come, you are going to build up the bridge between spirit and matter. Now, if these are the kind of spiritual realizations of Satyavan already there, even before he met Savitri, and you see the fulfillment of all those things in Savitri, would he desire all that was there in his childhood? I want eyesight, my father. I want kingdom and all that thing. Would he really still desire those kind of things? He won't. He won't. They're just small things, passing events. If happen, go on away. There'll be perhaps other way of doing better things and better things and all that. Maybe this is also an opportunity to do something still marvelous and all that. You think that way. Therefore, a question arises. I demand whatever Satyavan desired and had not for his beautiful life. <laughs> yeah. So that becomes a little uneasy kind of a thing for us to understand the two aspects. Here is Satyavan's teacher, and here is what Savit is asking for that little poor boy. Child Satyavan. Savitri is going back to the pure childhood of Satyavan. She is not looking for Satyavan who has grown up in his full spiritual stature. What as a child Satyavan would have dreamt, it is that which I am asking you. This is quite significant, and therefore this is at demand. This Satyaman may not require love and things. He doesn't need anything at all, you see. But the Chai Satyaman did, pure Chai Satyaman did. Give me, give, if thou must, or you know, canst refuse. So he has now, she has left the choice back on him. Back on him. <laughs> Turn the screw fully, you see. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Choose what you want. Then she says, demand. I demand. And what do I demand? Yes, give me what you can give me. If you cannot give me, say, sorry, I'm sorry I can't give. I won't feel sorry for that yours. It doesn't matter for me. Give me, give, you thou must. Now this is important. He says, thou must. It is a kind of obligation on him to give. It's an obligation. But if you find your, your, your self helpless against that obligation, okay, you can refuse it. <laughs> you can refuse. But you cannot even refuse it. If you can refuse, yeah. you can't even refuse that. You had to give what I want. So whatever my little boy Satyavan wanted in his childhood's life, you please grant him that. So I've seen in Vyasa Savitri all those uh, bones. So this is the first set of bones. Savitri receiving. Death bowed his head in scornful cold ascent. The builder of this dream like earth for man, who has mocked with vanity all gifts he gave. The builder of a dream like earth for man. Builder of this, that is Savitri. She is building the dream for man. 
builder of his dream like earth or man who has mocked with vanity all gifts he gave. Of course, he says all gifts. I don't know what all gifts he, he meant, but <laughs> he, he says. Not yet so far. Yeah. No, no, but earlier he says. But now see, he has to give. Now he has to give, you see. Now, what I'm saying is, I don't know what all gifts he gave. What are the gifts he has given so far? Nothing. He has not mentioned this, 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 this nothing. But he has made it open also. It's an open letter. You write down the open check, whatever you want. I sign it. Yeah, so, but it means that he is open to everything. <laughs> yeah. Who has marked with vanity all gifts he gave. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Updating his disastrous voice, he spoke. Obviously, he's kind of offended. <laughs> this lady, this young girl, talking like that to me, she doesn't know who I am. <laughs> this young girl of hardly 18 years, she's talking like that to me. I'm age old. <laughs> Indulgent the dreams my touch shall break. I eat his blind father's longing heart. Indulgent the dreams. So I am indulging. You want it? Okay, let me indulge in that. To the dreams my touch shall break. So my touch will break those dreams, you see. I eat to his blind father's longing heart. Kingdom and power and friends and greatness lost and royal trappings for his peaceful age, the pallid palms of man's declining days, the silver decadent glories of life's past. Okay, you want all the royalty, all the riches, all the majesty, whatever. Okay, there you are, here you are. Go ahead, have them. You me, you, you thou must, all the thou canst refuse. Give if thou must, because you have offered. Death acknowledges Savitri's strength, which does not deserve a trivial crown, but something precious, something very noble. But could be those because of the pacts which fate, what Savitri is asking, is it because some pacts with fate, because there's mention of pact with fate earlier, pacts with fate, could be, could there be nothing but something of wayside sweetness, almost valueless? Should Savitri accept this? Cannot she refuse this, what she's offering? Yet, she teaches not by her mind. There is the occult meaning and content in his offering, in her receiving. She is conscious of her immortality, but also sees a kind of significance in the offer made to her. There is a meaning in the offer made to her. Therefore, she demands, she says, I demand what you give. She doesn't say, give me, I demand. Which also means that she has actually won the first round of the battle. Savitri has actually won the first, I demand. She has won the first round of the battle. Got the reward of the labor of the battling gods, what the gods are striving against night, that reward Savitri has won through the mouth of death. What the gods could not give, it is that which death is offering to her, which is remarkable. Gods cannot give eyesight to the Masena. Gods cannot give back 
to him the kingdom he has won it from death himself that is the first round first victory for savitri she has won the first round she sees death as a huge mask and it is what is behind that mask from whom she is going to get what is being offered to her so it is not directly in fact it, it is not in fact from death she sees somebody behind a mask and it is through him that she is going to get what she wants which the gods cannot give she demands what satyavan in his childhood could have wanted to have i sighed for his blind father lost kingdom the royalty of a rich life that what would i ask for as a child you see here is given the one who wiser group adverse fate you see this is what he was talking about so i think adverse fate god's goods i restore the deluded soul prefers to impersonal nothingness is bare sublime now you see it is i it is death alone who can do that as i told you maybe divasana had done lot of worship lot of tapasya lot of yajnas i don't think the gods would have been able to give him back all those things the sensuous flash of the light i give to eyes which would have found a larger realm a deeper vision in the fathomless night for that this man desired and asked in vain is this man a still i don't know whether it is satyavan or dimasena it could be dimasena also this man man could be dimasena the sensuous flash of the light i give it is to satyavan sorry to dimasena deeper vision of the fathomless night why still he lived on earth and cherished hope back from the grandeur of my perilous realm go mortal to the small permitted sphere get out from here now live in your small little hut go back now home i granted what you wanted go back now go mortal So there cannot be any greater irony, greater mockery than that. To die in a small permitted sphere, you are safe in a small permitted sphere. Go and live safely in a small permitted sphere. Hasten, fit-footed, lest to slay thy life, the great law thou hast wallet mowed, open at last on thee, dear marble eye. You have often read abyss. the uh, authentic night they will open their eyes they swallow you up. they will consume you straight away hurry up go back go back go back before they rush out but savitri answered the distant purse was spirit i was thy equal mate now this is what i was telling you again savitri is revealing herself who she is see at every point you have here savitri's statement about savitri herself was spirit you are a was spirit i was your equal spirit born i was thy equal spirit born was she really just equal to him Huh? she says i was equal spirit born but was she really equal she is something more than him otherwise how can eventually she conquer him you are equal but how the how the how the uh, this will take place 
actually let me see what I did here world spirit about the equal spirit born as if the moment death was born Savitri also took birth as a world force that is what it means a constant counterpoise against the power of death first it would mean first came death and then came Savitri world spirit about the equal spirit born her strength matches with his that is the first thing because they are equal yet she is stronger she has taken mortal birth which is very important it is that mortal birth which makes her stronger than immortal death she has taken mortal birth and done yoga to house the divine shakti in her soul nothing of the kind is done by death mortal birth and done yoga to house the divine shakti in her soul he wanted to see her the divine power behind Savitri later on death wanted to show me who are you who is there behind you then only I will eat show me that I will worship her if the divine truth the divine power is there behind you show me her I would go and offer myself to her that is the greatness of death also he would not yield to any lesser smaller power at all only the supreme truth that counts for him and he is ready to surrender himself to her to the supreme truth otherwise I will hold on to my law my nature my sabhav my character of accomplishing things he wanted to see her and worship her she did it. World spirit, I was thy equal spirit born. I am immortal in my mortality. See, that's the point. You are an immortal in your immortality. So what? So what? Who cares? Come down here in the mortal world and become immortal. Then I can understand your greatness. Then you will be greater than me. Or perhaps I tremble not before the immobile gaze or the unchanging marble hierarchies that took with the stone eyes the law of fate. Marble hierarchies they have accepted the law of fate and death. What are the marble hierarchies? All these climbing planes, one above the other, right from the bottom to the topmost, over mind, perhaps even beyond, they are farming frozen powers, helpless, they cannot do much. All these oro opna, I mean, vital, mental, physical, etc., all the way up to the top, spiritual, all these farming hierarchies, typal worlds. Therefore, they are marble, frozen in their scope and possibilities. And they simply watch helplessly the stone eyes of law and fate. They do their own little work, but they can't do much. That took, that look with the stone eyes of law and fate. My soul can meet them with this living fire is a soul's living fire out of the shadow give me back again into earth's flowering spaces at the one in the sweet transiency of human limb to do 
Pretty my spirit burning will. That is the entire thrust of Savitri's order. I demand what you give me, but now I must have this. Out of the shadow, she is now in your shadow. Give me back Satyavan into those flowering spaces. For what purpose? In the sweet transience of human life, to do with him my spirit's burning will. She cannot do her spirit's burning will in this world without Satyavad. If I had to succeed in my life's mission, I must have him back. There is no doubt about that. There is no question about it. This is indisputable. It is unchallengeable. Now, what is the kind of work she is going to do with Satyavar? Into earth, flowering spaces, Satyavar. There will be flowers, there will be gardens, there will be birds, there will be chirping sounds, there will be all sweetness, all harmony, all joy everywhere. There will be the expression of the spirit's possibilities in his creation. It is that in human limbs to which this will happen, to do with him. My spirit is burning with. It is not the spirit of Satyavan, but Satyavan in the human limbs, it is on the human earth that thing had to happen here. I will bear with him the ancient mother's load. I will follow with him a path that leads to God. Ancient mother, we have seen earlier many times this ancient mother. The mother goddess who has been the presiding deity of the earth. It is her load, Savitri is with. I will bear with him. Yes, I am there to carry on her load. To bear with him the ancient mother's load. To follow us path. In fact, she says, to follow us, to bear. So, what does she want to do with such a one? She will bear with him the ancient mother's load. That is the first thing. She wants to follow, she wants such one to do what? To bear with him the ancient mother's load. To follow with him path that lead to God. If this cannot be happen, if this cannot happen, if the if I cannot bear the ancient mother's load, if I cannot follow the path that leads to God, then my existence is meaningless. Else shall the eternal spaces open to me, I will go and vanish into my species. While round strange horizons, far the sea, traveling together, the immense unknown, I will go back and disappear. For I, who had trod with him the tracks of time, with him, such a one, tracks of time, can made behind his steps whatever night or unimaginable stupendous dawn breaks on our spirits in the untrod beyond. Wherever thou leads his soul, I shall pursue. I am not going to stop. I will follow him. If you are taking him, I will also follow him. I am not going to go back. You have given me the gifts. Thank you very much. The gifts have gone back, not the earth. They are getting materialized on the earth. But that is not my aim. I will follow him wherever you are taking him until you give him back. She has traveled with him the tracks of time toward the stupendous dawn. To the tax of time, what do you say? Tax of time, him with Satyavan, to a stupendous dawn. We have come so far in the civilization, in the spiritual history. Whatever thou leads his soul, wherever thou leads his soul, I shall pursue. 
but for her claim opposed implacable, insisting on the immutable decree, insisting on the immutable law, the law that cannot be set, that cannot be placated, that cannot be appeased, immutable, that cannot be mitigated. He is insisting on the implacable decree, immutable decree, immutable law. Yes, I am here for all for this. That is my job. I am not going to budge away from the responsibility of mine. Whosoever you are, I don't care about that. I am going to stick to my law. And the insignificance of created things. So in comparison with this, what are these created things after all? They are also insignificant. Out of the rolling waves of night that came born from the enigma of the unknowable depths. So this is really the enigma from the unknowable depths. How this has really happened? How he could come up at all? That is the enigma. A voice of majesty, appalling and appalling scorn. So he is both voice of majesty and scorn. As when the storm here tightens rise sea, sorry, as when the storm here tightens riding sea, throws on a swimmer its tremendous love, remembering all the joy its waves have drawn. So from the darkness of the sovereign night, again the woman's boundless heart arose the almighty cry of universal death. So again here you got a powerful homeric simile. The almighty cry of universal death. Hast thou got wings or feet that treat, thy, treat my stars? You are a human creature, you are a mortal. Do you have got wings to fly? Yeah. Even the gods cannot fly in my wing, in my world. How hast thou got wings or feet that trade my star? Frail creature with a courage that aspires, forgetting the bounds of thought, mortal road. You are a thinking creature. You are a mortal creature. You are forgetting all that and you are flying as if on God wings. What are you doing? What are you imagining about yourself? My law is implacable. My law is immutable. My decree is immutable. What are you up to? Understand a few things at least. Their awesome coil before thy soul was formed. I, death, created them out of my void. All things I have built in them and I destroy. Savitri has no god wings to fly in the sky. She is a mortal, must remain confined to mind. That is the argument of death. She should not turn to unhappy things. She should not turn to unhappy things. Else she might awake from their uneasy, iron-hearted sleep, the furies. Savitri should keep quiet. Otherwise, the furies which are asleep here in this night will awake and they will pounce upon you. I death created them out of my void. All that he has said, I have created them out of my void. I made worlds my net, each joy a mesh. A hunger amorous of a suffering prey, life that devours is my wandering breath, whose transience was imagined by my smile, flee, clutching thy poor gains to thy trembling breast. 
pierced by my pangs, time shall soon appear. Yes, all this fury will rush on you. Blind slave of my deaf force, whom I compel to sin that I may punish, to desire that I may scourge thee with despair and grief. And thou come bleeding at me at last. Thy nothingness recognize, thy greatness, no, what we are. Greatness at that time, nothing. Turn not attend forbidden happy things, men for the souls that can obey my law. You are safe in my law, so go back. Otherwise, these furies will rush on you. From their uneasy iron heart is from their uneasy iron heart is sleep. The furies who avenge fulfilled in desire. The furies will rush on you constantly. The three angles, the Greek furies, three enemies, Electo, the unceasing, who is always there. Magera, who is always grudging. Tisiphone, who is full of vengeance. It is these things will rush on you, these furies. These furies, they are foul smelling, they are bad swings, their skin is black like coal, their hair entwined with snakes, entwined with snakes, they carry torches in the night. They have whips in their hands to punish whosoever disobeys them. Whips. And they carry cups of poison. Have it, have it, have it. <laughs> the furies who avenge fulfill desire. So if you don't go back, this is what will come out of this night. Be careful. Be aware of it. Dread lest in skies where passion hope will live. The unknown's lightning start and terrified, lone sobbing hunted by the hounds of heaven, again the hounds of heaven, a wounded and forsaken soul, thou flee to the long torture of the century. Go away, go away, run quickly to the long torture of the century. Nor many lives exhaust the tireless wrath. So that will be the wrath of this night. Be prepared for that. Hell cannot slake, nor heaven's mercy as it. So neither hell can quench it, nor heaven shower mercy on you. You will be absolutely helpless, both from hell and from heaven. So the, the wisest course for you is to flee, go back, go back before the furies appear. I will take from thee the black eternal grip, clasping in thy heart thy face exiguous doors. Depart in peace, if peace for man is just exiguous. Let me see what I written, exiguous. I will take from thee the black eternal grip, clasping in thy heart the face exiguous doors. Depart in peace. A peace for man is just. He knows that peace is not just for man. But if you want, okay, go away. 